Hello and welcome to this uh, presentation of the IEA's Global uh, Critical Minerals Outlook for 2024. Um, my name is Tim Gould. I am the IEA's Chief Energy Economist, and it's a, a huge pleasure to welcome you all to this um, to this webinar. Um, we released this work back on the 17th uh, of May, um, but this is the first time that we've done a, a, a public presentation of the findings. Um, what we're going to do is, um, after this very brief introduction, I'm going to pass the floor to Taeyun Kim and his team. Uh, to walk you through some of the key findings of this work. And then we're going to have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I'm very much looking forward also to the opportunity to ask questions of this very talented team. Um, but I would not like to deprive everyone else of that opportunity too. So please, if you have um, questions that you'd like to see answered, please put them in the chat function of the Zoom, um, either as we go along or towards the end, and we'll get through as many of those uh, questions um, as we can. Um, but we're looking to occupy one hour of your time. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're roughly splitting that half and half between the presentation um, and the Q&A. Um, as many of you will be aware, uh, critical minerals have become a major focus for the International Energy Agency. Um, our core foundational mandate is on energy security. And for us, um, it's incredibly important as we move through energy transitions, the transitions to a net zero energy system, um, that we stay ahead of the curve on new and emerging issues uh, affecting the security of energy transitions. Um, that's why back in 2021, uh, we had a first landmark report on uh, the role of critical minerals in clean energy transitions. Um, and that's why we have returned to it on a regular basis uh, since then. Um, some of you will be aware that last year we had our first critical minerals um, market review, which looked at the here and now, the state of play in the market for these uh, minerals and metals. Uh, and this year we have a, a really major update to that work, looking not just at where we are today, um, but also updating uh, and, and giving more depth to all of the uh, the scenario projections that we have um, in our work. Um, critical minerals, the issues that we're talking to, about today are very much now mainstreamed uh, within the IEA um, and recognized as such by IEA ministers when they met uh, earlier this year at the 50th anniversary ministerial meeting uh, of the IEA. Um, there is a security component to that discussion, and, and some of you will be aware that there is a, a new IEA voluntary critical mineral security program um, among the member countries uh, and involving also other parts of the IEA family. We're going to focus today very much on the more analytical aspects of the IEA's work, and to deepen and broaden our understanding of that, I'd like to pass the floor across uh, to Taeyun Kim, with uh, great thanks for his leadership uh, of this analysis. Over to you, Taeyun. Thank you, Tim. It's great a pleasure to be here to present our view about critical minerals. Today, the team will go through some of the key findings of the, the recent report, Global Critical Minerals Outlook 2024. So before delving into the key findings of the outlook, I will start just by looking at back at what happened in the market in 2023 and early 2024. And as you all are aware, the, the big feature of the market in 2023 was about price declines. After sharp increase in 2021 and early 2022, by and large, we are back around the levels seen pre-pandemic and slightly above the historical average. And battery metals saw a particularly steep declines with lithium spa prices plummeting by 75% and prices for cobalt, nickel, and graphite all dropping by 30 to 45%. And it is interesting to look at the what, what is the reason behind these price declines. It is not because demand faltered. Actually, demand growth remained quite robust in 2023 and also the, in the past years, but supply growth has been a lot stronger than the pace of demand growth from increases from Africa, the Indonesia and China and other countries. 
So, and also there was an impact of inventory overhang in the downstream sector from battery cells and cathode, and those all contributed to some, some large drop in prices in, in 2023 and, and in 2024. And these lower prices have dampened appetite for the investment appetite for some, some, among some investors, but overall the capital flows still remain pretty robust. In the left chart, investment in non-ferrous metal production, critical mineral mining grew by 10% in 2023. This is the smaller than the 30% increase in 2022, but still quite robust growth the trend. And investment by the lithium specialist show a sharp 6% increase despite some weak price environment. Likewise, Exploration spending also rose by 15% in 2023, slightly smaller than 20% in 2022, but they're still growing quite robustly, led by Canada and Australia and Latin America, which is the positive sign for future the diversification. And these price declines have some two side of implications. On the one hand, it's a good sign for good news for consumers, and it can make our the clean energy deployment much more affordable. So the chart you are seeing is the IE's Clean Energy Equipment Price Index, which is a basket price of the, the solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and electrolyzers. And until 2020, this price index just kept declining at a rapid pace. But in 2021 and in 2022, in a second year in a row, they increased. And there are many factors that help this the, the trend, but high the material prices is one of the key factors in shaping this trend. And now with prices falling in 2023, we saw this equipment price index the went down by 8%. And especially battery pack prices, we saw the 14% decline in 2023. So it highlighted this impact of this material price in ensuring affordable and speedy the energy transitions. So, so by and large, and this is helping the, the deployment, clean tech deployment in recent years. But on the other hand, it is the making the spending to ensure diversified supply less appealing to investors. So for, in the case of Nico, for example, we identified some 30 mining projects that are at risk at today's Price, price, low price environment. But what struck us from during this analysis is the over over seventy five percent of this project at risk are located in outside of today's top three producing countries. The project that could contribute to more diversified supply going forward. So this the price decline have some impact can hamper the progress on diversification and much needed investment going forward. That is the two side of implication of this price declines. A final element of context, clean energy deployment has been accelerating strongly. We know there's some concerns on the topic, but it's important to note the many reasons for optimism. First, impressive solar, where new capacity additions are 85% higher than last year. Wind deployment is resuming and EV sales remain robust. When focusing on battery storage, stationary storage of electricity on the grid, growth is much higher than expected with the expansion rate more than doubling year on year. It, and early signs from 2024 show continued robust growth. China added 45 gigawatts of solar power in the first quarter of this year, and strong solar deployment is happening in other key markets. In Q1 2024, electric car sales grew by 25% compared with the first quarter of 2023, similar to the year-on-year -year growth seen in 2022. This then sets the scene for our discussion on the impact for critical minerals. We think the momentum for clean energy deployment remains robust, and so does demand for critical minerals. In all our scenarios, demand for many energy transition minerals grows strongly over the coming decades. In a scenario that reaches net zero goals, demand for these minerals quadruples by 2040. Now, in terms of individual minerals, Total demand for lithium really stands out with ninefold demand growth by 2040. 
This is due to its indispensable role in batteries. Graphite is a close follower with a fourth-fold demand growth due to its strong position in battery anodes, as well as for electrodes in clean steel production. Demand for nickel, cobalt, and magnet, magnet rare earth elements all double over the same period. And finally, copper, copper demand registers the largest growth in absolute volume. What does this suggest? While well, today's markets are relatively well supplied, this may not be a good guide for the future, requiring a medium to long-term view on the market. And Eric talked about some robust prospect for demand growth going forward. So next question is about what about supply? So here in the chart, do we show the total demand for these six key focus minerals split by two portions? The, the upper portion is about the portion that is met by secondary supply, recycling and reuse. And the solid, the yellow area is about the portion that need to be met by primary supply. And then we built, we conducted some detailed assessment about project by project, individual project, to understand whether they are going moving ahead. So we built two supply scenarios based on the chances they're moving ahead, taking into account various factors such as the project development stages and financing, the permitting, and, and others. And the, we then compare this base case and high case supply scenarios against the, the material requirement in our the announced pledge scenario, which is the scenario that they meet countries meet their climate goals and to understand where how this expected supply from announced project compare with the material requirement and also how today's geopolitical concentration level would evolve over time in both in mining and refining and in the, using this aps as a benchmark and you the situation in 2035 looks as follows there are some three broader groupings the first grouping is about copper and lithium so here, the, the expected mine supply from announced project meet only 70% and the 50% of the material requirement in APS. Still, there are some gap between expected supply and, and the material requirement. And the second group is about nickel and cobalt, where the supply, the balance looks tight relatively to confirmed project, but the situation looks much better if the prospective project in our high production case are included. And on the final group is graphite and layer element. Here, we don't, we, they may not face supply volume issues, but the, here the issues is about high level of concentration of supply on a few number of countries. So when gaps exist, the, there may be potentially, be, this gap may be potentially closed by developing additional project or scaling up recycling further or introducing some range of material efficiency measures beyond what we already have assumed. So this, Aim of this exercise is to provide some framework to assessing where the, the today's the project development stage stand in terms of meeting the future demand growth and how the what kind of risks may arise along the way. So the overall supply picture looks much better than we assessed a few years ago when we released the report in 2021, but still there's still much the, to, 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 to go more to achieve the climate goals. But the same cannot be said for diversification. So our analysis of the announced project shows limited progress in diversifying the sources of supply in, in the past and also going forward. So geographical concentration of mining operations is set to rise further or remain high over the protection period. For refined materials where the level of concentration is greater, the, the share of top three producing countries have all increased since 2020 with a trend the most pronounced for nickel and cobalt. And announced projects indicate refined material supply still set to remain highly concentrated in, in a few number of countries. This is because the most of the production growth the, is project are being developed in today's incumbent players. Between now and 2030, some 70 or 75% of supply growth for refined lithium, nickel, and cobalt rare earth element comes from today's top three producers. And as you can see from the chart, in many cases, top one single country account for a large portion of the total supply demand, the, the supply growth for refined materials for Indonesia, for nickel, and China, for all others. In the earlier slide, the, I mentioned about graphite, rare earth element may not face the volume supply issues, but 
these are the materials that face the major the concentration problems. So in the base case, over 90% of battery grade graphite supply and 77% of refined layer element originate in, in China. So it means the diversification still remaining a big issues for the, the borough to pursue. In natural gas markets and broad energy systems, resilience analysis, often called N-1 assessment, is a tool to understand potential vulnerabilities in the system. We applied this to the critical mineral context to see what, ha what the system looks like when the larger supply is excluded from global supply and demand balances. The supply remaining after excluding the largest supplier is known as the N-1 supply. This analysis reveals an interesting picture. For copper, China is the world's largest supplier of refined copper, but it is also the largest consumer of copper. So excluding the largest supplier does not have a material impact on global balances. But the picture is very different for other minerals. And in most cases, available N-1 supply would fall significantly below material requirements. In the case of nickel, where the world's largest supplier Indonesia is excluded, the available N-1 supply is substantially lower than demand. The EU Critical Raw Materials Act targets that no single country should supply more than 65% of EU's, the Europe's annual consumption, implying that at least 35% should come from non-dominant players. If we apply this 35 threshold to this picture, the available nickel supply just reaches that minimum threshold. However, this issue is far more stark for graphite. Although there is ample supply of graphite globally, the expected supply of outside of the largest supplier, China, meets only 10% of the requirements, entirely insufficient to meet this minimum threshold. This indicates the major vulnerability to supply shocks, disruptions, and geopolitical events, and that without significant efforts to develop additional projects in geographically diverse regions, this increases supply risks and makes announced diversification goals highly challenging to achieve. The mining picture is also quite different in terms of ownership to compared to by location. First, many of the top mining countries such as Australia and Chile for lithium, but in particular DRC for cobalt and Indonesia for, for uh, nickel, their companies are actually majority owners of very little of the mining operations. Despite Indonesia supplying over half of global nickel supply, Indonesian companies are majority owners for less than 10% of production. For DRC, which supplies two thirds of global cobalt supply, DRC companies are the majority owners for less than 5% of production. So who owns all this mining? Chinese companies play a major role across all critical minerals, but they are particularly major roles in Indonesian nickel mining and cobalt mining in the DRC with Chinese companies owning about 40% of both uh, global supply of each. Despite having very little domestic mining uh, itself in Europe, European companies also play a major role in the mining of copper, nickel, and cobalt. And this is particularly through multinational mining majors um, such as Glencore. The same is true for the US with major roles from US companies in copper and lithium production. In all scenarios, the increasing demand for minerals that we've already shown here today means that there will be a substantial growth in the market value of these minerals. And a key question is who will capture this benefit? In fact, we estimate that the market value of minerals will more than double in climate-driven scenarios from an estimated 325 US billion dollars today to almost 800 billion US dollars in the NZE scenario in 2040. Looking purely at where mining is occurring in our base case scenario, Latin America, Africa, and Indonesia see the largest market values to 2030, which is largely driven by expansions in copper mining for Latin America and Africa, but we also see expansions due to lithium for Latin America and lithium and cobalt for Africa. Um, sorry, lithium for Latin America and lithium and cobalt for Africa. Indonesia also sees a large growth, and this is largely concentrated in nickel. On the other hand, for refining, the growth is largely concentrated in China, which sees an over twofold increase to 2030, 
and we see that the country holds an almost 50% of the market value for refining by then. These increases pr primarily occur due to expansions in copper, lithium, graphite, and rare earth elements refining, and Indonesia also sees um, a large growth, again, mainly due to nickel. One of the new features in this report is a detailed mineral specific risk assessment to understand potential risk areas that could hamper progress towards energy transitions. The framework has four main categories. These are supply risks, geopolitical risks, barriers to respond to disruptions and exposure to ESG and climate risks using some 20 quantitative and qualitative indicators under each category. Overall, we can see that lithium and copper are more exposed, exposed to supply and volume risks, whereas graphite, cobalt, rare earth elements, and nickel face more substantial uh, geopolitical risks. We can also see that most minerals are exposed to high environmental risks, meaning that they are happening in areas with low environmental and social performance. In aggregate, um, lithium and graphite show the highest scores, followed by rare earth elements, nickel, and cobalt. When thinking about ways to ensure reliable and sustainable mineral supplies, the focus is often only on investment in supply projects. And while investment in new mining and refining projects is essential, it alone might, might not be sufficient to meet the demand in ambitious climate-driven scenarios such as our NZE scenario. We think there's a significant scope to unlock the potential of demand-side actions such as recycling, technology innovation, and behavioral changes, which includes the right sizing of EV batteries. If we look at the recycling rates over the past decade, they've remained more or less stable. But in order to be aligned with our NZE scenario, this would need to change, and we believe that it can uh, with growing policy attention. In our analysis, recycled quantities of copper and cobalt could reduce primary supply requirements from mining in 2040 by 30%, and for lithium and nickel by about 15%. We also estimate that around $800 billion of investment is required for mining to 2040 in the NZE scenario. However, Without the uptake of recycling and reuse, the, this mining capital requirement would need to be a third higher. Taking the example of lithium markets, where today's announced supply projects are not in line with the demand in the NZE scenario, without additional measures, lithium demand would grow to about 780 kilotons in 2013 in the NZE scenario, which would require a four and a half times increase in new supplies in order to meet this demand. However, with the help of right sizing of EV batteries, scaling up recycling, and continued investments in technology innovation for alternative chemistries, as well as increasing adoption of LFP and sodium ion batteries, this demand could be reduced by about 25% which saves an amount equivalent to today's global lithium production volumes. With these reductions, the new supplies would need to grow by about 20% per year between today and 2030. And the lithium industry has managed to deliver such a scale of growth in recent years. For example, lithium raw material supply grew by roughly 20% in the past five years. And this paints an optimistic picture for future demand and supply balances. In our next area of work for this year, we will be uh, releasing another special report on the topic of critical minerals recycling, and we invite you to stay tuned for that. Continuing our discussion on ensuring a secure supply of critical minerals, we also recognize that this cannot happen at the expense of environmental and local community. And this is why we have been tracking ESG performances of major companies with strong presence in energy transition minerals. And our analysis shows that while in terms of sustainability reporting, the industry is headed towards the right direction in terms of ESG performance itself, it's showing a mixed picture. And we can see on the screen on the left-hand side, the indicators that are showing a positive trend and other indicators that are headed towards the opposite direction. But we also recognize that this is a complex issue, that a business could have high ESG um, awareness, but due to declining ore and 
declining um, quality in the reserves, it becomes that much difficult to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, for example. And we will be continuing to expand our ESG analysis. But in addition to that, the IEA Critical Minerals Data Explorer has been updated. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this online tool, uh, we provide demand projections uh, under three energy scenarios for 37 critical minerals and almost a dozen of alternative technology cases. A new feature that we want to highlight today is an introduction of mining and refining supply projections based on existing and announced projects. We highly recommend you to take full advantage of the Data Explorer as this is available to public, everyone and anyone. Thank you and I'll pass back the floor to Tim. Thank you so much uh, Yun Yun and thanks very much to all of the members of the team that just um, laid out for you, I think very clearly the uh, key findings of this analysis. Um, we're now moving to the Q&A section of our, um, of our event today. Um, and I noted that there's um, a question came in on price. Um, so what are the long-term price assumptions for lithium? And I'd like to, since there's another price issue that's very much in the news at the moment about copper, copper prices have rallied strongly in recent days, um, maybe I can ask... Eric to comment on the lithium question and maybe Taeyun, you want to say a couple of words about um, what can we read into the recent developments in copper prices? Is that an indication of um, shortage uh, on the supply side? So uh, Eric. So for, for lithium, we, we don't project prices, of course, but key parameters are for supply, demand, and also tech trends. Um, what we've seen as a short term is that the market has been growing very, very fast compared to many other minerals. Um, so demand is very, very rapid, um, but so does supply, which has shown a significant ability to ramp up in the recent years. Um, so looking at the lithium market, um, I think the dominant uh, message would be that we need to be prepared for continued volatility. Thanks, Eric. In the case of copper prices, and we are they indeed seeing some rapid rise in copper prices is mean very much exception in the, the overall trend of price decline we have seen for battery metals. And in the medium to longer term, we see some, some robust growth prospect for copper demand. So copper demand driven by industrial activities, but also the grid networks, renewables, and there are and EVs, and there are some the plenty of factors that could the support the copper demand. But on the supply side and Beyond the medium term, after 2025 and 2026, we don't see that much large scale, high quality project in the mining side that may some, the, have some, some gaps between announced, the, the expected supply from announced project and the material requirement. But that is the, the some medium to longer term picture. But if you look at the very short term market perspective, and in 2024, we might see some very slight deficit or some balanced market and also some slight surplus in 2025. So I think the, the market is the already some taking into account some of the, the future, the supply demand perspective already. But very if you look at the very short term, it's mainly about this, how the industrial activities might evolve in the, in the future. So the still the share of the energy transition and clean tech in total copper demand is rising, but still the majority of the copper demand is the is arising from the industrial, the construction and building and other sectors. So, so what happens in terms of the industrial activities, manufacturing output, and especially in China, will underpin the future, the price development in the short term in 2024 and 2025. Thanks very much, Taeyun, and thanks very much to everyone that's um, putting questions in the chat. Um, there's lots of very, very good topics coming up, and I'd like to stay with Taeyun, perhaps to answer this question from Austin Pellman. At first glance of the report, it doesn't highlight much on iron, steel, aluminium. Um, if this is the case, is the IA planning on updating its reporting on these materials also? Yep, indeed, in the critical mineral report, and we started from copper to and covered all these battery metals from lithium, nickel, cobalt, graphite, rare earth element. And, but we didn't cover this aluminum and iron ore still in depth because the, in the, 
the IEA's broader long-term energy the modeling framework in the major long-term publication, World Energy Outlook, and also the energy technology perspective. We cover the steel and aluminum as an independent sector, and we are every year we are updating the supply demand projections and how those sectors can decarbonize. So still we recognize this iron ore, steel, aluminum play a major role in underpinning the energy transitions, but these are dealt by the other the work stream in the IA. So the, the critical minerals report will likely focus on the copper and battery metals, rare earth elements, and some other materials going forward. That's great. Thank you very much, Taeyun. I, I see a question on um, recycling. Um, so maybe we can turn to those that issue area now. Uh, John Collis asks, what do you see as the greatest hurdles for critical minerals uh, recyclers? Uh, and that's tied in with a topic that I know we've uh, talked a lot uh, about within the team on, you know, what, what the, what's needed in order to scale up um, uh, battery recycling. And perhaps, I don't know, Amrita Shoban, between you, we can um, have some answers on that one. Sure, I can start and then I'll maybe pass the floor to Shoban to um, continue. Um, in terms of recycling, we're seeing quite uh, good progress, promising progress in terms of uh, the build out of recycling infrastructure. For today, the, the main issue is the availability of feedstock for recycling. Currently, the feedstock is mostly based on uh, manufacturing scrap. And however, we see this picture changing quite drastically from the beginning of the next decade when the first fleet of uh, clean energy technologies, particularly EVs and also solar panels will start to be uh, retired. Um, on the other hand, we do still see some need for policy action in order to standardize the, the policies across countries. In On this front, I think the EU has been doing some good work and especially with the introduction of things like the battery passport, which um, have uh, assigned traceability of uh, the supply chain uh, of batteries. Uh, at the same time, we still need more efforts when it comes to uh, the second-hand market uh, for for EVs, and overall the the trade um, of of these clean energy technologies and. Um, where they are deployed and where they will be they will be recycled and on the other hand we also have the uh, for EV batteries in particular we have the issue of chemistries where we are currently moving closer to uh, chemistries based on fewer critical minerals such as LFP and sodium ion batteries but this also makes uh, recycling these uh, batteries slightly less um, fiscally lucrative uh, and for that, to comment more on the chemistries, I'll just pass the floor to Shobhan. Thanks, Amrita. So um, already well covered, but uh, to go a bit deeper on the EV battery recycling, which is going to be one of the largest sources of critical minerals, uh, secondary sources of critical minerals. There are some key issues that really uh, stand out in the policy space that should be should be looked into and are challenges particularly as, as uh, Amrita mentioned, the standardization of waste codes and transportation codes, and that's particularly an issue for, for batteries and black mass, which is kind of uh, the, the feedstock that goes into it. And there's a lot of mismatch between the transportation uh, and, and these codes. And so standardizing that so it can be much more efficient in terms of supply chains is really, really important. And alignment with international shipping regulators is particularly a key issue. Another particularly uh, key aspect for EV batteries is defining of the extended producer responsibility principle. So where where the actual responsibility li lies and who who must contribute and the to contributing to approve schemes for collection, take back, and where where that responsibility lies should be clearly clearly defined in regulation. And this also should include a provision for secondary markets because EVs are expected like a lot of uh, conventional cars to be exported to secondary markets. So what does this mean for, for their take back and, uh, and their eventual recycling? And then finally, uh, facilitating the development of collection and take back infrastructure is a key uh, policy um, imperative and must, must be uh, um, ensured because to really help build these supply chains and, and uh, enable the recycling to take place. And this must be coupled with incentives for consumers to actually increase collection rates. Thanks very much, Amrita. Thanks very much, Shoban. There's um, a couple of questions on, on cobalt. Um, I'd like to come to uh, Yun Yong on that. 
Um, there was a question from Rafkana. What can we expect to see in cobalt prices given the rise in copper prices? Uh, what are the most significant determinants of cobalt market prices? And perhaps a slightly broader question related to the, um, the projections. Um, we do have a shrinking share of cobalt in battery chemistries. So why do we project then um, such a robust demand outlook for, for cobalt? Um, Yun Yung, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, while the IEA do not provide forecast of individual mineral prices, we can talk about implications of prices in the future, of course. Um, it is different with copper in that for cobalt, its demand is focused on EV batteries, whereas for copper, it has wider demand, uh, wider uses in demand. For in terms of trend of the industry headed towards a low cobalt or even no cobalt chemistry. Um, um, in terms of that, while cobalt demand is not set to, well, why, while we project that it will not grow as largely as its battery mineral peers, such as lithium and nickel, because the EV, uh, EV market in itself, the pie, the size of the pie in itself is growing, which is why we still still project a higher or a robust uh, demand for cobalt, and that is that it would be also a determinant in the prices. Thank you. Thank you, Yunyun. Um, I saw that there was a, a question on um, LFP. Um, from Saido, what impact would the increase in the proportion of LFP batteries have on demand uh, for cobalt and nickel? Um, you know, and maybe Eric, you could also touch upon, you know, will that increase in, in the role of LFP, um, would that have any, would this reduce con concerns around the adequacy of, uh, of security and mineral supplies? And then more broadly, a question on substitution possibilities. And um, perhaps Tayun, you, you'd like to say a few words on that. But first, um, Eric. Yeah, so um, LFP is taking an increasing role amongst battery chemistries, where some of the most dominant investments we've seen in Western countries was traditionally NMC, nickel, manganese, uh, cobalt. Um, so a few things to note. The first thing is that this penetration is much faster than investors expected, especially in Western markets. Um, it comparatively, comparatively, it requires a bit cheaper minerals, so there's no cobalt, there's no nickel, but it still uses lithium. Um, so that's those are things we've already integrated in our demand scenarios, including those on cobalt. Um, and one of the key questions here is, is whether the sourcing strategies are fit from from the downstream players are, are still fit for purposes for purpose, because there's still some areas where there could be concerns. Um, in terms of lithium requirements, you'd need a bit more carbonates and a bit less hydroxide. Um, if you're looking at uh, iron phosphate, which is the FP of LFP, um, there's also a number of questions because phosphates are typically used in fertilizers in quite large quantities, uh, but those usage, usages are very related to, to agriculture and food production. So there's the question of whether there might be some substitution or additional pressure on that market, which would be an area of concern. And of course, um, you need refining uh, at much higher grades than that for fertilizers. So there's a number of, of questions that could still exist for LFP, especially uh, taking into account that there's some actors which have a lot of investments and a lot of focus in LFP chemistries, whilst others have been focusing on, on other ones. So they, they need to catch up virtually. Thank you, Eric. In terms of substitution options and Broadly, when you think about this material efficiency strategies, there are multiple aspects the, that can contribute to reduction of in demand. So one is about the technology innovation. There are some questions about this efficiency in solar panels, and we think the reducing material intensity in the use of silver and, and silicon in solar PV is one good example about how technology can play a role in reducing demand. And also, substitution is another possibility that can help reduce the moderate material demand. And there are some many example areas, for example, in grid networks and aluminum is really taking some big 
share in the, especially in, in overhead and also low voltage and medium voltage segment we are seeing. So in liberation copper demand, that is one example. And also in battery chemistries, then we are seeing some reduction of cobalt contents in chemistry instead of the, the raging demand for manganese and lithium ion phosphate and others. So there's another example. So on the other side and lithium ion battery as a whole, there are some new technologies also the, the emerging on the horizons. For example, sodium ion battery is one of the key examples that can the gaining some market share in, especially in storage applications. So Shoban may explain a bit about how sodium ion batteries may play a role in this demand picture materials. Sure. Thanks, uh, Taeyun. So sodium ion batteries are the leading chemistry, which can be used for many lithium ion applications in EVs and in grids, which do not contain any lithium. So that's its key advantage. And during the two years of very high lithium prices we saw in preceding years, sodium ion commercial development accelerated rapidly with some of the largest battery makers, such as CATL, Northvolt, all announcing their commercial sodium ion cells. And very impressive performance has been demonstrated. However, the drastic fall in lithium prices we've seen over the last year has really stalled these kind of plants because sodium ion development really hinges on the lithium price and to have its cost advantage. And while the lithium price is extremely low, those cost advantages to scaling up sodium ion are diminished. And so though sodium ion is a very, very, uh, has a chemistry of a lot of potential, it will never be used for high energy density applications, but for low range EVs and for grid scale, it is a really appropriate chemistry. Um, it does have a, a, a um, we see a, a promising future for it to reduce lithium demand. However, it really does need higher lithium prices to really continue accelerating that development. Thank you very much uh, for the answers on that. Um, I, there's a number of questions have come in uh, touching on different aspects of the geopolitics of uh, critical minerals supply. Um, I see a question from Ji Yong. Um, there was a slide that looked at geopolitical risk. Can you discuss in more detail how you assess that risk specifically and what factors went into the numerical rating? And I think there's a comment on uh, from another question about the use of the OECD trade data on exports, um, which don't yet incorporate a new round of restrictions. So is that something that you would consider for uh, future iterations of that work? And then a question from Peter Handley. Do you see an emerging trend towards China refining in resource-rich countries and manufacturing clean tech products in final markets uh, like Europe? And um, maybe I'll ask uh, Taeyun to comment on both of those. And then um, the risk assessment framework and also the sort of N minus one analysis highlighted that graphite is a particular um, it's, it's particularly affected by considerations of, of, of geopolitical risk. So maybe I can, after Taeyun, ask um, Eric to comment on, you know, the prospects for diversification of graphite, graphite supplies. But uh, Taeyun, maybe start with you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. The, we conducted some very granular detailed risk assessment for six key materials, combining some 20 the quantitative and qualitative indicators. And those are categorized under four categories, supply, geopolitical, and ability to respond to supply disruptions and also exposure to climate and, 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 and ESG risks. And in terms of geopolitical risk, and we combined some several indicators, for example, the expected level of diversification, top three shares for both mining and refining is one obvious indicators. And on a, another indicator we used is about the, the hurdles to develop some build new supply chain in diversified regions. For example, how much capital investment requirement required for to build those the, the new diversified supply chains and how the cost gap the look like and also what kind of lease time and other technological hurdles exist. So that is some the quantitative assessment about those aspects. And one indicator is about the assessing the risk of some export the trade controls based on this using OECD's export restriction database. This is a very comprehensive database that tracks the past instances of the trade restrictions in, in different the commodities and different countries. So we the try to the do some scoring based on that, but that covers the the until some several years ago. So there are some recent the geopolitical and trade event like the 
the recent exposition in gallium, germanium, and graphite. So we also additionally took those into account in this the framework in addition to the OECD the database. But the, the US and, and the recent tariff was very recent event, so we could not the, include that in the, our recent discussion framework, but that can be incorporated in the, in the, the later stage. And in terms of the question about China's the investment in, in the refining operations in developing economies, and we actually see some large growth in China's the investment in overseas in mining investments. So the when we think about we all kind of the talk about this high concentration of production in China, but also China has a very strong the the dominance in refining operation. That means they need to import the raw materials from outside, some from the other other resource holders. So the security of supply for raw materials also a big concern for China. So we, it's one of the regions they are investing heavily in, in developing economies. So we saw some the if you look at the overseas mining investment by China in developing economies, we still so some continued growth in those numbers in recent years. So far, the refining investment, we saw the cases in Indonesia where some there are some specific the hurdles to build some exclusive industrial cases. So Chinese companies invested heavily on the Indonesia's refining, nickel refining specialties. And also there are some emerging signs that they are also as some more geopolitical the movement and concerns evolve, there are some growing interest about making investment in defining in developing economies. But still, compared with the mining investment, we don't see that many examples yet. But we might likely to see more events like that in the, in the coming years. Yeah, maybe just a, a quick comment on, on graphite. Um, so graphite is one of the one of the most important critical minerals you find in a battery by, by mass and battery grade graphite. So whether it's synthesized or whether it's refined uh, natural graphite that's been mined, um, the, this battery grade graphite is one of the energy transition minerals that has the highest level of supply concentration. Um, and so those are now affected by a system of export controls where exporters need to have a license to export them outside of the dominant producer. Um, there's a precedent we've been looking at which has been affected in the chips uh, industry um, with gallium and germanium. And what we've been seeing is that the, uh, the ex trade flows are, are, are bumpy uh, when those export controls are being put in place. Uh, but now there's still some flows going on uh, but there's still some areas of a strong concern in the sense that those authorizations are exporter specific. And so that can create um, rigidity as well as risks of market distortions in terms of access to supplies, for example. Thanks very much. Um, there's a, a couple of questions also on um, um, new technologies or new um, areas for um, extraction. Um, I see a question from Blaise Fanon. Do you expect the direct lithium extraction to have a substantial impact in the short term? And a similar one from Dan Weaver, what's the IEA's view on innovation in material extraction processes, e.g. direct lithium extraction in easing forecast supply shortages, um, especially given the average time taken to get new mines online? Uh, and perhaps while we're on this, this stream of, uh, of questions, um, a question from Michael there. Do these production assumptions or production projections include supplies from deep sea mining projects? I don't know. Um, Eric, would you mind talking about DLE? And then, uh, Tayun, do you want to take the one about deep sea? So um, we've been focused, having a, uh, we, we've, been, we've had a very good look at direct lithium extraction, and there's a number of of key benefits. Uh, this can involve less water consumption, and it also involves the exploitation of de de deposits in, in a diversity of contexts, including uh, with geothermal exploitation. Uh, so we have brine, um, and then the heat of the brine is used to produce energy, and that brine can also, um, lithium can also be extracted from that brine. So virtually, this can be zero carbon mining in terms of uh, energy consumption and, and carbon emissions. Um, but so there's this geothermal context, but we also know that uh, there's some applications of direct lithium extraction in deposits, which are cl quite 
where well, whether you whether it's a history of oil and gas extraction, and we know that some of those uh, large oil and gas um, um, industry players also having a very good look at those deposits. So this creates lots of opportunities um, for the lithium industry. Uh, one of the challenges is that the chemical solutions uh, that are involved are very different from one project to another. And uh, the diversity of deposits means that there's no one unique solution for all of those deposits, to our knowledge. Um, we know for a very long time, um, pilots had not been showing um, that in, um, the, there weren't any uh, large scale pilots operating. Uh, but now we are seeing a few projects starting to ramp up. So now will be the moment where we'll see if that technology can succeed or not. Yep. Thanks, Eric. In terms of deep sea mining, and we are closely monitoring the how the discussion at the UN ISA is progressing in terms of this the regulating deep sea mining activities. But still, this there's a lot of uncertainty about this deep sea mining development. So so far, we don't include those projects in our the space case and also high production case calculations. Thanks very much. Um, there's some questions on diversification and the prospects for diversification. Um, and I'd like to ask Alex, I think, about which regions or assets um, have the potential to diversify um, nickel supplies. And perhaps, um, Amrita, if you'd like to comment on the potential for um, the potential role for countries in Africa as uh, critical minerals uh, suppliers. Um, that's more on the sort of extraction side, um, certainly. And then um, maybe Tayun, if you could comment on the, you know, the, the particular challenges that you see in diversifying the midstream. So refining uh, and processing value chains. So on those questions, maybe we begin with Alex. Thanks, Tim. Um, so for diversification of nickel supplies, I mean, for all uh, supplies, we can look at our high production case to start with, which considers projects that are a at a reasonably advanced stage of development, uh, which are seeking financing um, or permits still, um, so they aren't included within our base case. Many of these projects um, for nickel are outside today's dominant producers, um, so they could lead to the diversification of mined and refined supplies of nickel. For mining, the top three producers today are Indonesia, the Philippines, and New Caledonia, and projects under the high production case would that could come to fruition um, that could lead to diversification are in Australia, in Brazil, um, and the US. For refining, today's dominant producers are uh, China, Indonesia, and Japan. And similarly, projects under the high production case that could come online in Australia and Canada have the potential to diversify these nickel supplies. Um, and of course, these are only considering projects uh, that are currently within the pipeline and they don't consider projects that may materialize in the future, which currently aren't in our, um, in our cases. And we can see, uh, looking at uh, reserves, that there are large amounts of reserves in places like Australia and Brazil, as well as smaller amounts in Canada, which could see projects in the future and lead to diversification of supplies of nickel. Um, so taking the question on uh, Africa's role in critical mineral supply, um, it would not be wrong to say that Africa's role uh, as a region that uh, supplies critical minerals has already been really prominent so far, and this will continue to be the case in the future. Uh, I'll quickly give some reasons to support the statement that I just made. For example, uh, global um, exploration spending in uh, 2023, so last year, grew by about 15% with Canada and Australia registering the largest increases, but followed closely by Africa. Then in our base case uh, supply scenario, Africa witnesses an expansion by, of 65% in its uh, critical minerals market value by 2030, so in the next six years. And this can be attributed in large part to the uh, expansion of copper production in the region. Then all, it already um, a very significant and uh, the largest producer of cobalt today, mined cobalt production in the DRC is poised for uh, significant growth also in the near future with several new projects uh, ramping up and the country will account for about two thirds of global mined production by 2030. 
Then uh, if, we did, if we talk about lithium, lithium mining is a recent phenomenon uh, in Africa as well, uh, with Zimbabwe taking the lead today, but projects could uh, come up also in Ethiopia, Mali, Namibia, and perhaps also uh, the DRC and Ghana. Uh, talking about manganese, South Africa is the world's largest producer with 35% of production uh, today and Gabon with 25% comes in second. Um, finally, we also see a, a lot of progress in terms of investment um, from outside of the region uh, into this region. For example, the United Kingdom has pledged about uh, 1 million US dollars to identify bankable projects in processing and the midstream value addition uh, in about 14 uh, African countries. So I think the scope for, for growth for Africa uh, is enormous and, and yeah, that, that shows us that diversification is definitely uh, on the cards. Yep, thanks Amrita. In terms of refining and processing operations and since 2020 over the three years and we haven't seen this much visible progress in diversifying, refining and processing supply. The, why, why, is that, why is the case? Because there are some several barriers in building some new the refining facilities in outside of today's dominant players. One is about this, the cost gap. So they require some high capital the requirement than incumbent players. And also operating costs tend to be higher with some, some higher energy costs in other regions. And also there's some limited value placed the, by consumers on high ESG performance, for example. And also often this refining and processing industry is sitting between the upstream suppliers and the end downstream consumers. So they are, tend to be price taker and some limited leverage on the adjusting price depending on the market situation. Those all contribute to this some, some limited progress on diversifying and refined supply. But the Going forward, we think there are some strategic support might be required to build support some new the diversified facilities, refining and the processing operations in outside to these dominant players. And but also one need to be very careful about the deciding the project because the not all project may be viable in terms of economics. So some more careful and detailed review about potential economics and competitiveness is required to the decide the some the viable project. And also the this also requires some strong the international collaboration because the not all the viable project, competitive project sitting in the 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 in their own country. So the, there may be some other projects that can be very competitive in other regions and some more international support to collaboration to support those projects might be required. And also the developing thinking through some incentives to the reward high environmental social performance of the product is also one essential step to incentivize investment, making the investment case for this new diversified refining and processing facilities. Thank you very much, Tayun. Um, I know we have only a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to get through two more questions if I can. There was one on copper uh, from Hyunbuk Lee, um, which maybe, Shobhan, I can turn to you. Um, do you think the mid to long term supply and demand imbalance of copper will be resolved through recycling? Thanks, Tim. So, um, the indeed, recycling is a really key part of many measures that are needed to close this. Um, significant supply gap that which develops for copper in the medium and long term. However, it cannot be met on its own through just recycling. So the primary driver of the supply gap is the declining ore quality uh, for copper around the world. For example, the average grade uh, ore grade in Chile has decreased 30% since 2005. And this is increasing costs for production. And there are no, there are very few new um, resources which are easy to exploit. So this requires both supply and demand side measures. So on the supply side, yes, recycling is, is extremely important. Uh, currently, secondary supply is around 17%, um, but including direct use of scrap, it's around 30%. But this needs to be ramped up quickly. And key areas that, that should be focused on is, is making collection easy, incentivizing collection and, uh, and structuring kind of a take back infrastructure, which is, uh, isn't, isn't so streamlined at the moment. 
but it also does need demand side measures. So material efficiency initiatives, substitution such as aluminium, which Tayun mentioned earlier, which is key um, and can be used for a lot of uh, a lot of electrical grid applications. But it is important to note that aluminium has five times the emissions intensity of production of copper. So it does come at a consequence. And then also using plastic piping in uh, in some plumbing applications instead. So all of these measures are needed, um, and it's going to take also additional investment in the mining sector, but it, to close this gap. But it is it is difficult and will require a lot of measures on both sides rather than just recycling. Thanks very much, um, Sherban. Now I'm conscious that um, this is the last question. We have some questions unanswered. Um, we will endeavour to get back to all of those. Uh, who have asked questions that we didn't manage to answer. Um, but there's a one which is a nice sort of broad one uh, that uh, came in about what the deficit in global mineral supply by 2040 means for the global energy transition. So I'd like to take that, please, for, for Tayun. Um, and when we talk about deficits, please be conscious that it really depends which demand scenario you're looking at. So um, just to echo some words from Yun Yung at the start, you know, refer back to that demand data explorer um, to make sure that you understand exactly the assumptions that go behind each of those uh, those those projections. Um, but to you, to you, um, what does that deficit in global mineral supply mean? Presumably upward pressure on prices, but is there a risk of disjointed transitions where developed countries are able to pay the higher mineral prices, but developing countries are unable to pay and access the minerals impacting the speed of their transitions? So some final reflections from you. Yep, I think this is a very excellent question, very interesting question. So one of the reasons that we are paying attention and be making some effort on this topic as an IEA. So just before going into these questions, when we talk about this potential, the gaps between the projected supply from announced project and material requirement, this gap is not set in stone. So we assess the expected mine supply from announced project and then how they compare with the project material requirement in our multiple scenarios. But that requirement, the obviously differ by the scenario you, 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 are, you are taking. So in our state depot scenario, demand is obviously lower, but in a net zero scenario, demand is higher. So it also depends on how you compare against the our scenarios. But we based our analysis on the climate driven scenarios in our announced project scenario and also the natural scenario and then we pull some cases and with some gaps between the expected supply and demand and that means the we need to some that the all purpose of this exercise is to give some indication about where we need to make some further effort to ensure reliable supplies going forward. For example, this copper lithium we mentioned about some potential gaps, and that means some more effort is needed to make more investment in new supply and scale up recycling and also further accelerate the technology innovation and demand side measures. That is the, the whole purpose of the analysis. But when there are some shortages and or some deficit might if they emerge and that might impact on these prices. The, and then these high prices make, make our transition either slower or more expensive. And that can impact, can be more impactful for developing economies because the when price go up by certain amount and the advanced economies they could pay some more the, the, the cost for those increases. But developing economies who want to expand their value chain to clean tech manufacturing that requires a lot of minerals and metals that may not be the case for this emerging resource holders. So that is one of the reasons that we need to ensure some put more effort to some the close narrow this potential gap as much as possible through a range of measures I mentioned before. So that is the one of the key motivation for us, the IEA to pay attention and looking at this topic to give some indications about how we can close that gap going forward and make more the equitable and fair and the rapid transition for all the, the global economy. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Taeyun. Um, I wish we could continue this, but unfortunately we are, are out of time. Um, there are some topics which I think um, deserve uh, some additional consideration about green premium and uh, various bifurcation of markets. Um, but we'll have to come back to those. There is a lot of discussion of these and other issues in the report itself. So I would encourage everyone, if you haven't done so already, uh, to refer to all the materials um, that are online. Um, we're really grateful to the interest shown today in this work and the attendance at this, at this webinar, uh, which we will be making available uh, to, for review um, on the web. 
Uh, and I'd like to conclude by thanking also Tayun and this uh, great team of people who've been working uh, so hard on this global critical minerals um, outlook um, to thank them and uh, to look forward to continuing this conversation with you all uh, in the future. Many, many thanks.